beauty of Bitcoin is there's been so much development on public private key cryptography and the Bitcoin system people spend obsessive amounts of time thinking about you know seed phrases and seed phrase recovery and public private key pair and then multi signature and signing devices uh, you know because you're going to move a lot of money around that's important well what if we could leverage Hey guys, welcome back to Everyday Finance. In this video, Michael Saylor discusses Bitcoin and crypto. Bitcoin has numerous practical applications. The use case that he frequently discusses is the store of value, which holds significant importance. There is another aspect of Bitcoin that has caught Saylor's attention, and it revolves around trust. The network is decentralized, storing data securely and ensuring the integrity of transactions. Initially, the idea was to move money without relying on a trusted counterparty. However, Saylor suggests that we could go even further and keep the money in cyberspace indefinitely without the need for a trusted counterparty. And lots of things Michael Saylor discusses, so please watch the video to end and like, share this video and subscribe our channel Everyday Finance, thanks. Bitcoin has a lot of uh, use cases. I mean, the, the use case uh, that I talk about a lot is store of value, and I think that's obviously worth quite a lot to the civilization. A use case that um, we're going to talk about uh, with David Marcus at the end of the day is uh, medium of exchange, and, and that's a very exciting session, and there's a lot of discussion about Bitcoin as a transactional settlement technology. But uh, there's a third value proposition uh, for Bitcoin, which I'm um, also very interested in, and it's a system of trust. You have this uh, immutable, unstoppable, immortal, decentralized network, and it's storing data, and it's providing integrity, and it's executing transactions. And of course, the, the first grand idea was, um, first people thought, will move money without a trusted counterparty. And then they thought, well, I guess we could just keep the money in cyberspace forever without a trusted counterparty. And that was the medium of exchange and the store of value. But the third thought is, well, if there's something that I trust more than I trust any particular counterparty, maybe I can leverage that system of trust. And that was really the, uh, the genesis of this next project. And I'm going to introduce it, and then Cesare, our head of engineering, is going to show it off. Uh, it's based upon this idea of uh, decentralized identity. Um, for those of you who, uh, you know, who use uh, Instagram or YouTube or, um, or WhatsApp or maybe X, you know, one of the frustrations has been, how can you trust anything that's posted? Uh, for a long time, I have a fake Michael Saylor uh, channel that spins up every 15 minutes on YouTube. And the way that you know it's not me is, is I'm offering to give you two ETH for every ETH you send me. Uh, and that's definitely not me. But also, I'm offering to give you Bitcoin. I'll give you two Bitcoin for every one Bitcoin you send me. And, uh, and it's very frustrating because I know it's not me and a lot of people know it's not me, but, but some people seem to think it's me because I get a lot of emails, you know, sometimes saying, you know, I, I got tricked by that. And uh, the solution oftentimes is a very laborious uh, verification process. It may be expensive. It costs like $1,000 a month for a gold check from uh, X Twitter. And uh, it's a proprietary gold check because you can't take it to WhatsApp or YouTube, you know, or your Microsoft environment. And, uh, and of course, you know, Meta's got their own little blue check thing, and then Google's got a different black check thing, and they don't work that well, and they're all very proprietary. <clears throat> and uh, that's one of the challenges of digital identity today. You know, you, you end up with a centralized identity, and maybe you're logging in with Facebook, or you're logging in with Apple, or you're logging in with Google, and you start thinking, well, what happens uh, if one of, those, uh, one of those websites or one of those systems gets hacked? Or what if, uh, what if it goes down? Or, or what if uh, one government somewhere 
decides to send a court order to one of those, you know, maybe the Australian government sends a court order to one of these things and they take you off the network. So it's, it's uh, a lot of anxiety, it's very fragile, it's very brittle, it's very expensive, and it just, it just doesn't work that well. And I think that's been a frustration of a lot of people. Um, you know, you end up with all sorts of uh, challenges with these frameworks. How do you verify who you are? You know, uh, is the data private? You know, do you really want uh, some central organization to know everything you logged into? You know, um, how do they interoperate? And um, that caused us to start thinking, wouldn't it be great if instead of a blue check or a green check or a gold check or a black check, what if there was an orange check? What if there was a, a cyber passport that you got once in your life and it was based on public private key cryptography that, um, that you could take with you, you know, if I paid a nickel for it or a penny for it, and it was anchored into an immutable, unstoppable, incorruptible network. Based in the United States, Spot Bitcoin Exchange Traded Funds, ETF, have experienced significant net outflows recently. Black Rocks is a company that deals in shares. The Bitcoin Trust experienced a significant outflow on May 1st. BlackRock's Bitcoin fund saw $36.9 million flow out, while nine other Bitcoin ETFs saw a combined $5,268 million in outflows. Interestingly, the Bitcoin ETF had no flows during this period, as per preliminary data. The FidelityWise Origin Bitcoin fund had the largest outflow of the day, with $91.1 million in net outflows. The Grayscale Bitcoin Trust experienced significant outflows of $1,674 million, marking the largest single outflow day for the US-based spot Bitcoin ETF since its launch in January. This development is noteworthy for the ARC 21 shares. Bitcoin, ETF, and Franklin experienced outflows of $98.1 million and $13.4 million, respectively. This coincides with a 10.7% decline in Bitcoin's value over the past week. However, Nate Chessy, the president of ETF Store, highlighted that the Ayers Gold ETF and Spider Gold ETF have seen outflows of $1 billion and $3 billion, respectively, this year, despite gold's 16% increase year-to-date, as mentioned in a May 2x post by Dai. Let's get back to Michael Saylor interview. That could be a global standard as opposed to some local nation-state standard. And, um, and then maybe I would log into that system using my private key and public key com, uh, pair. And, and we saw a little bit of this pop up. One example is uh, in the Noster environment, when people started using public-private key pairs to log into uh, various uh, Noster-compatible clients. And of course, we saw another example of this in Bitcoin, where the public-private key pair is how I move money around. And uh, the most famous example or question here has been, well, will Satoshi ever prove they exist by digitally signing a message with their private key? And of course, we know that's possible uh, in the Bitcoin environment, and it's worth, in this particular case, $65 billion to do it. But we haven't really levered this idea of public-private key cryptography anchored into a proof-of-work network um, for most commercial applications. And MicroStrategy thought maybe we could approach this idea of um, decentralized identity combined with Bitcoin and then create um, an enterprise application for it. So that was the genesis of this orange project. And what you can see is on one side, you've got the de uh, decentralized identity, and that's the public-private key pair. On the other side, you've got the Bitcoin network, which is your system of record, which is really just a global fault-tolerant computer system controlled by no government, no corporation, no person. 
Our vision is to provide an internet native uh, decentralized digital identity backed by Bitcoin. So we want to use the open standard of DID, and then we want to use the open standard of Bitcoin, and put the two together. And of course, why would you use Bitcoin? Well, it is fault tolerant, it is censorship resistant, it does use the most advanced cryptography. It's a lot better than most people's uh, password managers and these, these federated systems. It's distributed. But of course, you know, we come back to the issue of, of why is Bitcoin successful? It's open, permissionless, egalitarian. Um, that's why it's successful. So an open standard means it could appeal to every country uh, you know, and it could appeal to every company. There's no way that Apple wants to trust Google. There's no way that Google wants to trust Meta. There's no way that Americans will trust a Chinese company. There's no way the Chinese will trust an American company, right? And so how do you build a system uh, for millions of counterparties that, that uh, maybe don't trust each other? And how do, you, how do you make it open? And of course, the beauty of Bitcoin is there's been so much development on public-private key cryptography in the Bitcoin system, people spend obsessive amounts of time thinking about, you know, seed phrases and seed phrase recovery and public-private key pair and then multi-signature and signing devices. Uh, you know, because you're going to move a lot of money around, that's important. Well, what if we could leverage all that uh, knowledge and all that research but use it in order to fight cyber hacking and phishing scams and, and counterfeiting? and plug it right into uh, an enterprise system. So, I mean, what are DIDs? You know, a, a unique identifier. You know, users control their own keys. You've got privacy and you've got decentralized verification. You put the two together and that's something really special, the DID plus the key pair. Um, so, what we're proposing is an open standard. It's DID colon BTC. It's open and compliant with decentralized identifiers. It's, it's simple, it's secure, uh, it's extensible, and it's efficient. Um, what's really exciting about this is um, you can uh, integrate with this at the layer two. So this is an open protocol to the world. Anybody could just work with this protocol and build their own stack of enterprise apps or retail apps or the like. But um, f uh, it's also interesting because it's extremely uh, efficient. You could burn up to 10,000 of these uh, identifiers in a single Bitcoin transaction. So imagine doing one off-peak transaction and then you've uh, captured or created 10,000 orange checks. And of course, they're good. to say they're good for life is maybe an understatement. I mean, they're, they're good for lifetimes, right? Once you've created this, maybe it's uh, good for 100 years or hundreds of years. So it's kind of a, a cool idea. It's a lot better idea for identity than I pay five different big tech companies $8 a month or $100 a month or a dollar a month for the rest of my life in order to keep my verification check. This one you can take with you. Two individuals who were once highly regarded in the crypto industry are now facing imprisonment. In the United States, there have been varying durations of time since the hearings for former FTX CEO Stam SBF Bankman Fraud and former Binance CEO Champing C. Ziao. Many individuals within and outside of the crypto space have raised concerns about the disparate treatment these two industry leaders have received in the U.S. legal system. Bankman Fried may be in his 50s when he is released from prison, and it seems that he will have fewer assets compared to Jay, who is expected to be out of prison by the end of the year. According to Forbes, Jay has an estimated net worth of $33 billion. However, let's take a step back for a moment. Bin Fried was arrested in 2022 and extradited to the United States. He pleaded not guilty and was given house arrest before being remanded to jail. Following allegations of witness intimidation, he was prosecuted in a 6E trial. Ultimately, he was found guilty and sentenced to 25 years in prison.
Jaya was charged in 2023, pleaded guilty, and was allowed to remain free on bail. However, he was later sentenced to four months in prison and will surrender himself in a matter of days. The former FTX CEO was charged with seven felonies for defrauding investors and misusing customer funds. Sai was charged with one offense for not maintaining a sufficient anti-money laundering program at Binance. The charge is more in line with a regulatory violation rather than a criminal offense. Meanwhile, SPF was charged with wire fraud for secretly misappropriating billions of dollars in crypto custody with FTX to support Alum. Mark Beeney, a former assistant U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of New York, believes that both crimes are serious. However, he argues that SPS's crime was far more severe. Despite speculation from many crypto users, it is highly unlikely that CZ and SBF will collaborate on a sale while in prison, let alone. Located in the same facility, the judge in the case hinted that the former FTX CEO may serve his sentence in a San Francisco Bay Area prison. Alternatively, he might be allowed to stay in New York while his appeal is pending. If incarcerated, he will spend four months at either the Federal Correctional Institution Sheridan in Oregon or the Federal Detention Center SEDAC in Washington. The exact reporting date is yet to be determined. If you learned something from this video, then please like this video and subscribe our channel Everyday Finance, and we will meet in next video. Thanks.